Welcome to the fights that made me with myself, Umar Ahmed. I'm joined by Gareth A. Davis, the first journalist to appear on this podcast. Uh, I'm not sure if you've watched uh, any of the episodes, but they've been with retired fighters. Um, I've got trainers, promoters, and it's much easier to talk about the fights that made them in their career. Bit different having a, a journalist on. So we'll see how today goes. Um, just to let people know, we've picked some fighters, very illustrious fighters. Um, that you've covered and, and we want to talk about. Um, so it won't be specific to fights, but it'll be about fighters. And essentially, those guys have, have had a, a massive role in your career and, and made you. So let, let's start with the prince himself, uh, Nassim Hamid. Talk to me about that man there. Well, I've got to say overarching this, and I'll say it at the beginning and I'll say it at the end. Without them, what we do would be impossible. Without access to them, Without them, without the fighters, we are nothing. You know, we are not the man in the arena. They are the men and the women in the arena. And um, it's an extraordinary privilege when you look back on it, because you've made me think today about, I mean, we're going back 25 years today um, with, beginning with Nassim Hamid. Um, and remarkably, when, you, when time passes, you appreciate, looking back, how great that era or that person or that artist in the ring was. And Nazim Hamid was a, an explosive artist. Off the top of my head, thinking back to, Amir, to, to, to um, Nazim Hamid, off the top of my head, thinking back to Nassim Hamid, there's one big memory I've got, which is not even to do with his fights. It's being on my own with him one day in the Pocono Mountain Resort when he was training for, whew, I want to say Augie Sanchez or someone. I can't remember exactly who it was. But I traveled, he was still being trained by Manny Stewart, I think. Or it might have been, was it an Oscar Suarez at one point was his trainer? Mm -hmm. But I went to see him in the Pocono Mountain Resort and had a day up there with him. And he sat on, we were talking, and he was sat on a swivel chair. And he got up and I sat in the swivel chair. And I said, can you do that? Can you just do your movement? And I swiveled my chair, and he did all his movement. Oh my God, it was just unreal. Nazim Hamid, when the cameras weren't on him, was a very deep person, very deep. And the reason I tell that about that day is that the next day there were 50 cameras there, and he lit up, and he was the performer and the entertainer. But that day I was on my own with him, we talked about the universe. We talked about life. And he even said to me that day, you should convert to Islam. You're a Sufi, after our conversations. And it stuck with me. And Naz, for all his brashness and candor, and the, the, the showman, was a, and we know it now about him, he's a father now, and probably be a grandfather soon. He's, got beautiful children he's still with his wife and he's got an amazing story journey and he's loved by everyone he's appreciated now as I was saying he's so appreciated he was loved then but he's appreciated now um, but he's a he's a deep and honest and, and 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 very grounded individual and you don't always see that with him because when the cameras are on him he's he can't stop it he's got to entertain um, Power, precision, artistry, huge thighs. That that just it just had it it. Conor McGregor once said to me in an interview um, that he admired Nazim Hamid, and I can remember when Conor McGregor came on the scene. I was doing an interview with Naz or speaking to him on the phone, and he said, Do "You know, who reminds me of me." And I went, "Yeah, I get it." Conor McGregor, and there's a, because because 
there's, there's the super ego that comes out in some fighters. And he had that super ego and super id. The great travesty for Nazim Hamid and something I also learnt, the fight that made me, in a sense, that educated me, because that's the only way I can talk about this, is being educated about boxing through the journey of documenting like a scribe these people were going to talk about. And that for all the rise, there can be a fall. And the fall was Marco Antonio Barrera. And maybe there was a fall in leaving Brendan Ingle or leaving Frank Warren. But the journey was extraordinary. The memories will be etched there forever. And he is a very, very, very special talent. Naz will hammer me for saying, for not saying, he's the number one British talent ever. Um, but he's definitely, in my era and in the era, post-war era, he's definitely in the top five. Okay. Well, what a start to this podcast. You like that? Yeah, I did. Oh, uh, Naz is... I don't. I mean, Naz is very different now, and you know, his Adam, his son, he got beautiful children. They're beautiful people, but Naz hasn't changed. He, he, he's, you know, he's 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 awesome. I'd love to see him get fit and have another fight, an exhibition. Love it. Right. Let's move on to another one who is extremely popular, maybe in a different way. Uh, Ricky Hatton. Yeah. Talk to me about the Hitman. Well, outside Tyson Fury. Um, for pure fan popularity. And I don't mean, and we go back to Naz there for a moment, incredibly popular, unmissable. In terms of buzz by live audience, until we got to Tyson Fury, Ricky Hatton was the man. Remember, I was there for Hatton against Floyd Mayweather. I was there for his journey in America Obviously, the night he beat Costas U was extraordinary, and he says that's his Everest. And Ricky, again, is a very honest, modest, humble, and vulnerable person. And so many boxers are vulnerable, you know? And he's embraced his frailties and talking, talked about it and been open. And now in his 40s, he's, he's a great character. He's a blessing for us in British boxing. But the biggest standout was that journey through America. Because at the time, Lennox Lewis had done it in America. Um, no one had really conquered America properly. Hatton conquered America. And you still go to Vegas. When, when did he fight Floyd Mayweather? Was it 2008 in, yeah. in, in Vegas? Both undefeated, 80 odd fights between them. It was called undefeated, that promotion. He'd been on this sway through America. Obviously he'd beaten Costas you already. He'd, and Costas U, I think, was in the top five pound for pound at the time. And in Ricky Hatton's own words, the little lad from Manchester, I mean, I think he pinched himself at times. But the, the, the 25,000 or 35,000 that made the journey to America, to Vegas, singing There's Only One Ricky Hatton and Walking in a Hatton Wonderland, they still talk about it 15 years later in Vegas today. He left an indelible mark on what was at the, the time the home of big night boxing, the, the, the place for the biggest fight nights against, let's be honest, arguably the greatest modern legend in boxing, in Floyd Money Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather Jr. Um, I particularly remember that event because here's, here's a funny story, because Ricky, Ricky was brilliant with the media. And yes, Naz was headlines and brash, but Ricky always had a story for you. As you know, he's a storyteller. He can stand up on stage and, you know, he's a comedian and he can laugh at himself. And he always had a story. And we used to go and sit in the hat factory in Hyde in Billy Graham's old gym, sitting on, in a room about this size, boiling hot, because um, Billy's pet lizard that was about this big lived in the room, yeah? And it would crawl past you on the, on the sofa top. 
you have to do this. And Ricky's sitting there. We're all sweating, maybe 10 of us in the room for a media day. He'd done a workout. It was an old hat factory, as I say, in Hyde. And Ricky always had a story for you. He loved the media. He embraced the media. I say, very open and wasn't protective or um, social media wasn't like it was today. So um, that journey to fight Mayweather... And he'd been on a run in America, and he'd built Vegas, and he'd fought Urango and um, Colazzo. No, no, what was it, Colazzo? Yeah, Colazzo. And he'd fought numerous guys. But that was so enormous. And um, in the build-up, I did a sponsored four-page broadsheet supplement that was unheard of at the time on Hatton versus Mayweather. I went to Carol, his mother's carpet stall in Glossop Market, to do a recording for Woman's Hour with her on BBC Radio 4. You know, come on, Ray, bring that down, bring that, bring us a cup of tea, cut this, cut that carpet. To, you know, the fitters. She was running all the fitters there. Glossop covered my Amazing woman. Um, and when we went over to Vegas... You could not move for British fans. It was front, back and centre. It was unbelievable. And here's a fight that made me, and this is why I, I've included why, what made me this. I so bought into the hype around Ricky, I even backed him to beat Mayweather. And the great Colin Hart said, you won't do that again, son. Because you, you, you can't... Believe the hype. Sometimes you get drawn. You know what it's like. You get drawn into the hype around a fighter. Even a mismatch as a fight gets closer. When you're around them and everyone's talking in the milieu of the fight circus, you know, the genesis of these ideas comes. And it gets closer and closer, doesn't it? You find reasons not to pick the favourite. And it was just extraordinary. I hadn't, apart from big UFC events at the time, when the Brazilians were fighting each other in Vegas, Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, these kind of guys. We had not seen 10,000 people at a weigh-in, you know? And Ricky doing that, you know, remember, remember the weigh-in? And he looked amazing. Um, it was a great night as well, that fight. It was a great night, and it was a dramatic night. And I remember Floyd being dirty with his elbows and Joe Cortez... You know, Ricky still thinks Cortez refereed the wrong fight that night. But it was an extraordinary event. And it was an extraordinary journey with Ricky Hatton. And he was really responsible for big-time coverage of boxing at that time. And obviously, Calzaghi was rising at that time as well into his big fights. Well, that's a perfect way to move on to, in many people's opinion... Uh, the greatest British fighter of all time. Talking about the popularity there of Naz and, and Ricky, is it a shame when I just said, in many people's eyes, the best British fighter of all time, perhaps didn't get the, the credit and popularity that he deserved, Joe Calzaghe, Gareth? Um, I think with Joe, Joe's a homeboy. Never really liked leaving Newbridge. I, I love Joe. We are really good friends today. Um, you know, we're both Welsh Italians, you know. Um, some of my mother's family know his family in, 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 in Newbridge, in the Black, the Black Forest. Um, and Joe is... Joe's extraordinary because... It was so difficult to fathom with Joe. You know, we're talking about fights that made me, in, in that sense, trying to bring that back to that, that highway, if you like. And um, to talk about Joe, he was very reluctant to come and do media work through that whole run of... He was very modest, he, he was very shy, um, and not comfortable about opening up. He did at the end. He really got to enjoy the media in then because when you go on the road with a fighter, at the time, when you went on the road with a fighter, it's always the same, actually. You go on the road with a fighter. We're on tour with them, if you like. You're, you know this as well. You, you've done it many times now. You develop a bond with fighters. It's not 
fanboy, as a lot of people kind of, you, you develop a working relationship with them. And they do have their favorites, the people they're open, open up to, people they, they know, because they see your body of work over a period of time and how you outlay things that they're telling you. And the great thing about Joe was that he was a double act. It was him and da his dad, Enzo. You know, you remember Enzo? Yeah, of course. Kind of talking a million to the dozen, Sicilian accent with a bit of Welsh, you know, and like an absolute firebrand, but a diamond. They used to train in this disused old rugby club um, gym. Like, honestly, like, there was water coming in through it. It, it was amazing. Like, they are the epitome, Joe Calzaghi was the epitome of a diamond in the rough, polished, driven, persistently, indefatigably, indefatigably by his father Enzo. And without Enzo, Joe wouldn't have been Joe in the ring. You know, it was almost like Enzo would wind him up, wind him up and let him go. You know, the reluctant Joe. Yeah. Um, Joe's journey was amazing through the UK. Joe, even though we'd had big stadium fights, you know, we'd had Frank Bruno in the past, we'd had Lennox. Um, I can't remember if Naz ever fought in a stadium in the UK. I don't think he did. But Joe at the Millennium Stadium, Kessler and Peter Manfredo, you know, Manfredo was probably 30,000 there. I think, I think Frank Warren did the Kessler fight. Um, 50,000 there. I think we left at like, I, don't, I remember walking back to my hotel with groups of huge Welsh blokes from Swansea and Cardiff, like two in the morning, going, oh, okay, Miss Ozzy Osbourne, yeah? <laughs> um, the, you know, you're going, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And because, you know, they, they are big down there. I don't even down to, to that area. Hugh, Calzaghi, in, in Wales, I think, in Wales, Calzaghi was really celebrated, but I don't think until the very end of his career, and definitely after his career, was he truly celebrated. Because those last couple of fights, I mean, he had an extraordinary career. What was it? I can't even remember right now. 46 and 0, was it, in the end? 46 and 0. 46 and 0. Extraordinary when you think about it. What became evident with Joe was. It was all about the unbeaten record in the end, and it was so much psychological pressure on him. And the great thing about Joe was, you know, a handsome guy. Um, and you look at his physique, yeah? He never looked like he had the most extraordinary physique, but he's long, lean, really big. Joe's a big guy. I mean, he's your size. He's in his 6'2", or whatever he is, 6'1". And he's obviously filled out a much bigger man now, but. He was amazing in the ring, and what we learned with Joe was his dad taught him very unorthodoxly, or doxily, because his dad was a mu musician. Well, the punch combinations of Joe Calzaghe were extraordinary because his father was musical, and they'd go da 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 da, and people didn't like it. They called him a slapper in the end that he slapped. But in those combinations, he befuddled opponents. But he was fucking hard as nails. Absolutely hard as nails. And when Joe was in trouble, he had something in him. This is why he's a modern great. He had something in him. When he was in trouble, he would always fight back. And he was so naturally clever at movement and obviously as a southpaw, creating the angles. Um, yeah, he, he, he was a great journey. And obviously, at the end, he fought two American greats. Um, Roy Jones Jr., well, first of all, Bernard Hopkins, with, under Frank Warren, at Planet Hollywood. Al Pacino was there. All, it was a great... Um, um, Stallone was there. Because um, there, there was a whole kind of link up with Planet Hollywood with that. We're all staying at Planet Hollywood. And it was, I think the fight was at the Thomas and Mac, if I remember rightly. But it was, um, it was a, an amazing event, really good build-up. Bernard Hopkins knew how to sell a fight. 
And Joe that night outfoxed the old fox in a brilliant fight. Um, and again, I think about 7,000 traveled over for Joe. Um, I want to say, was that 2008 as well? I think it was. That might have been before, actually, Ricky Hatton and Mayweather, because I think Joe had beaten Bernard Hopkins and then came out to the Hatton Mayweather fight. And on the Sunday, one sports person, BBC Sports Personality of the Year, and it was presented there. I think we were all there as media watching it being presented and being back live. Um, so those two crossed over, but I think Joe's pure achievements mark him out. And then obviously the fight with Roy Jones Jr. in New York, I think that was a few months later. Obviously, that w he wasn't promoted by Frank Warren at that point, and it was acrimonious, the split. Um, again, it was... He really did finish off in an amazing way at light heavyweight against Roy J He finished off those last two fights undefeated, beating two modern greats in America. Yes, Roy Jones Jr. was slightly past his best, but it was a very special journey. And Joe is one of those people that left on his own terms undefeated. And that is so rare in boxing. Well, from one super middleweight great to another, let's talk about the Cobra. Yeah. Carl Froch, someone you were very close to, still are very close to, um, covered his whole career. Talk to me about Carl, Gareth. Um, got so much time for Carl, man's man. You know, and, and he's got better with age, Carl. He's really matured. Um, he's a fantastic broadcaster today. Very honest, knows how to play the game. Um, and didn't get, obviously, Frotch and Calzaghi never, never met, even though Carl at that time was calling for that fight with Calzaghi. Calzaghi didn't need Frotch at the time. Um, and I think Frotch's run and people appreciate it more the longer time's gone on. Something like, I think it was, I'm, I'm not absolutely correct in this, I haven't got it in front of me, but it was something like 11 or 13 world title fights in a row. The one loss to Andre Ward, who I think left the sport as the pound for pound number one anyway, undefeated himself. Um, the Super Six series, he was a part of that. Um, the two fights with Kessler, brilliant. The emergence of Eddie Hearn with him, um, a very young Eddie Hearn. Um, got to mention as well, in Frotch's early career, Mick Hennessy, who doesn't get enough praise in British boxing, instrumental. Maybe not in making Carl, well, he, he helped to make Carl the star he is today, definitely, no question about it. But Mick is an absolute genius at matchmaking and building fighters. You know, absolute genius. And it's not celebrated enough in British boxing. Um, he, he just knows so much. He is imbued with a sense of instinct um, in the sport. Um, Carl's run. I met Carl. Carl, if I'm explaining how you get to understand how fighters grow, and how they become successful. If I'm thinking about Carl in the realm of the, the, the narrow and deep version of, of this storyline, fights that made me, what I learned about with Carl was when I knew him as an amateur light middleweight, he wasn't the most confident guy. He used to get really nervous, but you, I watched him grow, yeah? Um, and I watched him grow into a guy who never believed he could be beaten. The, great, late, the late great Manny Stewart told me once, and I was in Klitschko's training camp, he said, I love that guy, Froch. He reminds me of Dennis Andrews, yeah? He was a great, really tough British fighter. Um, and he said, great chin, great power, never knows he's beaten. 
limited type of fighter, and I'm not saying this about Cole, but this was Manny Stewart saying this, limited fighter, but so dangerous to fight. And that's what Carl was. He only got bested once. N not by many rounds. I think I had it 116-12 from memory for Andre Ward in Atlantic City. Carl wasn't at his best that night. He, I do believe him when he says he was um, a bit camp-worn. He'd already fought Glenn Johnson, Glenn Coffey Johnson there as well on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Got to meet Carl's mad brothers or the mad brother, who's a great character, and the, and the family, um, their, their brilliant mother um, on that trip. Um, and, and really got to learn about Carl. That Carl is a very proud man who's made a special stuff. Um, and Carl, if I talk about fights that made me, we have celebrated Carl Froch more after his career is over because of his understanding of the sport and his achievements and because he's been there and done it and didn't get the credit he deserved at the time. Um, and, and I think we've learned from that. And I think you look back at some of his fights, the fight with Jean-Paul Scal in Nottingham in 2008. I think that was 2008 as well. Tyson Fury made his debut on that card yeah. as well that night. I remember meeting Peter and John Fury and the Egans who, t who had trained him through the amateurs. Jermaine uh, Taylor fight? The Jermaine Taylor fight. Well, the weird thing about the Jermaine Taylor, I watched it on some weird stream. I was covering the London Marathon the next day for the Telegraph, and I wasn't out at that fight. It was on some weird stream. Weirdly, he had this amazing fight with Jean Pascal that was live on ITV, five million viewers, and then they cut their boxing coverage. Extraordinary, like madness. And then he was on um, a, a, like a, a, a pay-per-view platform, Premier Boxing or something. Yeah. Um, was it Premier Boxing? Premier, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're talking 15 years ago here, um, and it only got like an audience of 30,000. I don't know if it got replayed somewhere on Sky the week after or something, but I remember watching it on a stream late at night in my room uh, uh, in one of the hotels, the Thistle Hotel, right on London Bridge, um, a tower bridge, and thinking, God, I've got to go and get down to the marathon in about three hours, and thinking, he's had it here, he's had it, he's had it, ticking down into that last round, and then he starts, never gives up, he says, he's never gives up, he's got that. Frotch is the kind of guy that would have won the Victoria Cross in a war, because if people were out there, ten of them, He'd have been running out and bringing them all back. He's that kind, he's that kind of person. A lot of it, all these guys are. Or, 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 but I, I just have that image right now. And that's what he did in that fight. He always knew he could do it. And that 14 seconds to go, the knockout, was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I think in that moment, he really grew as well. Because he knew that he'd put, he'd executed what he always knew about himself, that he would never give in, ever, ever give in. Um, so, Frotch's journey was extraordinary. It, it was the launch of, first time that I'd been involved in tournament boxing that was fantastic. First time I'd come, ac I'd come across the Sauerland brothers as well. Um, they were young then, um, and Kala and Nisa. Um, and, Great fun to be around. It was a different time in boxing. Um, and I'm trying to think where Carl went at the end with it all. There was the, there was the Kessler fights. There were the Kessler fights. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, the Boutte return. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Smashed him to bits in his own to words. Bits. <laughs> and again, he jumped on the tailwind of, you know, Eddie Hearn. And I think Hearn was on Sky then. That was on Sky So, so yeah. that, that elevated Carl into national stardom. Um, oh, because I remember when he beat Jean Pascal on ITV, I remember Carl putting his arms in the air and going, I'm now a superstar. And he was a superstar within our sport. Um, but the fans decide when you become a superstar. And that little period for him, and since, um, Carl is a superstar in the sport. There's no question about it. Um, and, and, and to this day, he is definitely... Um, in my f five 
five or six guys in my career who have just taught me so much about boxing. And again, like I say about all these guys, they are a blessing to us. We are, you know, without them, we wouldn't have this journey. But, you know, there are lessons to be learned and we give them things sometimes and we have relationships and, we, you know, what we do do, which we don't talk about very often is, we do talk to fighters sometimes off air and we talk about styles and um, we, we, we suggest things. We talk about um, how their PR is and all of those kind of things. And we do, because um, we're human beings with them. And it's a working, as you know, it's a symbiotic working relationship. Carl, clever guy. I, and and the, the other thing I loved about Carl was the fastidious notebooks, the fastidious notes. Um, yeah, he made the absolute most. Like Joe Calzaghe was reluctant, Carl Froch made the most of everything he had, and good luck to him. And he still does, I think, to this day. Gareth, talk to me about your memories and journey with Amir Khan. Obviously, became a global star uh, in the States. That's the, the journey I really want to sort of capture any moments that you've got with him and, and his dad, Shah Khan. So, yeah, talk to me about uh, Amir. Yeah, but by the time I was covering Amir Khan, um, you know, I remember, I think I came across Amir when he was like 15 and a half, 16. And obviously he went to the Olympics when he was 17. Um, he's fundamental because he, he reached out so that you were able to write stories about crossover. I mean, don't get me wrong, a lot of these guys I'm talking about, there was a crossover appeal. But with Amir, there was this journey, and, and Naz had begun it for British Pakistani Muslims. Obviously, Naz is not a Pakistani, he's, he's originally Yemeni. Um, um, but Amir became a darling because of his achievements as a 17 year old at the Olympics. And you mentioned Shah. Shah, with his Union Jack waistcoat in Athens in 2004. Um, and we hadn't had a British, Muslim, Pakistani, um, or Asian, if I use the word Asian, um, uh, star in sport who had Bollywood looks, um, was, a, was a playboy, you know, was not a bad, Amir Khan has not got a bad bone in his body. I've known him a long time. He's made some mistakes. I've seen him grow from boy to man. And that's what I enjoyed so much. From Amir, so many people we bump into in the industry now, so many people we, fans we enjoy at events. I think Amir is responsible for bringing, and I don't mean, I don't mean it exclusively in this lane, but I think he's really responsible for bringing our, that community in, in our country into boxing and feeling comfortable about being there, if you, if you understand what I mean. And I don't mean it in a race way or a, or a colour way or a creed way, but he opened, he opened the doors. Look at all the boxers we've got now. Look, you, you, on every card. There weren't in the past. On every card, in every city, in every gym, we have every colour and creed. And it's amazing. Amazing. Um, and I think Amir opened my eyes to what can happen in a society when you've got an iconic hero. And, and again, in India, in Pakistan, in the Middle East, he's got a huge following, huge reach. His work, he's one of the first that I came across who understood his, what he could do with his global reach. Remember Amir was the first of all of those guys really to be associated with a huge social media following, to break America because of that following as well, to be picked up by Richard Schaefer and Oscar De La Hoya. I think it was Richard Schaefer and Oscar De La Hoya, wasn't it at the time? With Golden yes, Boy. Yes, it was. Yeah, with yeah. Golden Boy, yeah. And then um, went on to work with every promoter there yeah, is. Yeah, every promoter. And never got his fight with Floyd Mayweather. It was that close, by the way. It was that close. 
Um, but Amir had an amazing career, always vulnerable in his fights, always exciting. Attack was his defense. Um, and it was an absolute pleasure to be around. You talk about hospitality, you would be invited to his apartment to do his interviews, to do interviews with him. He always courted the media in, 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 in an amazing way. Absolute superstar, still is to this day. Um, and um, again, um, I think his best moment was Devon Alexander. I was at that fight and he was extraordinary that night. I think it was that point after that where the, the Floyd Mayweather fight was yeah. really close, wasn't it? Or, that not. Performance. or not. Or maybe Mayweather looked at it and thought... I don't, I, I don't think we can say that about Mayweather. I mean, people say that. I don't think Mayweather feared anybody's skills in the ring because he, he genuinely is the one guy whose skills truly paid his bills and still paid the bills for him because, you know, if I can just nip over to the other side of the ropes and, and talk about Mayweather. He's the best I've ever seen live in my time. Incredible, incredible. And we forget how aggressive he was early in his career. Anyway, I'm digressing. Um, but again, I covered Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather for 12 or 14 years. I haven't even met, I'm just talking about British fighters here, by the way. I had a whole journey with Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather, four fights a year in America with those two. Um, for, I want to say, nearly 10 years. So many of their fights. I remember, in the end, going to stay in the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. And do you remember when Floyd's um, face or body was on 27 floors on the outside of it? It was his casino. It was his. Um, but, um, you know, Amir obviously bridged that period... Um, through a time when, you know, Pacquiao, and obviously he was on the axis working with Freddie Roach in the wildcard gym and sparring a lot with Manny Pacquiao, and they were both under Freddie Roach at the same time. So it was that journey as well, that axis. I mean, I, I, I really miss those days of going to Los Angeles and being around for a week. First time I ever met um, Coogan Cassius, by the way, um, I've told this story before. You know this story, don't you? Mm -hmm. He was Ricky Hatton's bodyguard yeah. when he was fighting Floyd Mayweather. Uh, fighting Manny, Manny Pacquiao's Pacquiao. brother. Yeah. Um, um, but Amir Khan has continued to be his aid work, his social responsibility, bridging, bridging his life between Dubai, um, um, Pakistan, um, the UK. Um, and I think Amir's work is not complete. He's bigger than boxing in lots of different ways. And he was thrust into that limelight as a teen, teenager, remember? And for all the, the, the minuscule things that he, he's done wrong or been um, covered over in the tabloids, and he, he's an amazing guy, an amazing character. Amazing. Well, that was Amir King Khan from one king to another. Last fighter we're going to discuss, the Gypsy King. Yeah. Tyson Fury is obviously still fighting on, uh, but the journey you've had with him so far. Yeah, Tyson Fury, talking about him, Gareth. Well, it's hard to top Tyson Fury. Still undefeated. Um, I w I, I, I've known Tyson, I would like to say, I mentioned earlier that I was at his debut, um, and I remember Mick Hennessy saying to him, again, he was under Mick Hennessy uh, at the beginning. Um, I remember Mick Hennessy saying to me, and promoters say this to you a lot, don't they? You've got to watch this kid. Honestly, he, this, this is the one. And um, I think he might have something very special in his daughter, Fran Hennessy, by the way. Um, Mick. Um, Tyson Fury um, has become the biggest star of all of them, really. His reach has gone bigger than all of them. His story um, is um, extraordinary. It's a story of redemption. It's a story, there's so many facets to the story. And if you follow it from inception or conception in 2008 on that Froch Pascal undercard to the journey 
to beating Klitschko, Vladimir Klitschko, and dethroning the heavyweight champion of the world in 2015 in Dusseldorf. And again, because he's a heavyweight, heavyweight boxing is bigger than all other boxing. And when it's big, it's enormous. Um, his journey to 29 stone after reaching that Everest against Klitschko. Um, if I, fights that have made me, obviously I'm associated a lot with Tyson Fury because we do have a fantastic working relationship. And I, and I have gained insights into the man that a lot of other people haven't seen. Um, he treats me with such respect, you know. If I sit down with him, the interview he gives me is, he really gives me considered answers. Yeah, he can be flippant when he's in that mood and tell me he's actually about to emigrate to Australia tomorrow and he's going to, you know, he's going to skinny down to cruiserweight and... You know, he's going to fight 20 more fights. He's going to fight till he's 55. Or he's going to retire till he's 55 and then he's coming back again. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but um, he's an extraordinary character. You know, when I talk to people like Frank Warren and Bob Arum, who've promoted him as well, about, especially Bob Arum about Muhammad Ali and Frank Warren about great figures like Frank Bruno and these other fighters that he's promoted, there is something very special about Tyson Fury. And you know that he's a one-off and he's grown into the role. Um, and he's, he, you know, again, I would say, you know, being a mature journalist when Tyson Fury came on the scene, um, again, the journey, going on the journey with him. I mean, I went out to Marbella when he was 28 stone, ran on the beach with him and Billy Joe Saunders and Ben Davison when he was thinking about the recovery. Well, we walked along the beach at the time. It was barely a jog. Um, watching that whole journey, being given access to document so much of his life, um, being given a nickname by him. I mean, I, I, if, I, if we're strictly talking about that, I mean, he's always called me Russell, as in Russell Crowe. But, but it's part of the character of the guy. Um, and again, he came back, the redemption story, and he also conquered America. Those, that trilogy of fights with, with Deontay Wilder, the, the, the Battle of Los Angeles, the extraordinary story when he rose like Lazarus um, in the 12th round like The Undertaker. And it's an extraordinary story. Um, and and I, he has to be in that list of the great fighters. And he's still going. Well, I found that very interesting, better than uh, what I thought, because I thought it might be a bit tricky speaking to a journalist about what you know, this podcast about, yep. but I think we've got some great stories. So I hope people enjoyed that. Um, Gareth A. Davis, thank you very much uh, for jumping on the fights that made me. Please like, comment and subscribe. We'll see you next week. We're out. Thank you very much.